um, while we organize ourselves on the stage, thank you to the organizers and thank you, Your Excellency, for what was an inspiring uh, story of uh, Bhutan and what a pleasure for a cynical old journalist like me to be in the presence of so many people so bent on improving the state of happiness in the world today. I applaud you all. If you thought 2016 uh, was bad, imagine reporting on it day in, day out. And as you rightly pointed out, it has been a chaotic start in some parts of the world uh, to 2017. So this is almost uh, time out for me today. And I'm going to take everything Everything. I live in Abu Dhabi, I program from the UAE on a regular basis, I'm well aware of the sense of positivity in this place, but I will take everything that I learn yeah. from this discussion across the next uh, three days at the World Government Summit and ensure that it informs our programming going forward. Uh, we, because, uh, and, and it's very clear, that we may have become substantially richer in re recent years, um, but in so many places, those benefits are offset um, by rising inequality and a deficit in trust and social cohesion. So welcome to a session um, that I am confident will play a role, a key role, in helping shape uh, a global dialogue on happiness and the role of government. I'm well aware in this room, uh, we have a room of global experts today. Um, looking at how this uh, new worldwide demand for more attention to happiness as a criteria for policy may shape up. So to all of you, uh, Mahabafi uh, Dubai, um, I think it's safe to say that my esteemed panel today is in agreement that a fundamental goal of government is to enable a happy society. I may be wrong, but I don't think so. <laughs> um, as Minister of State for Happiness in the UAE, Her Excellency Ahud Al Rumi's mission is to align the country's plans, programs and policies to encourage uh, the happiness of the country's society. His Excellency Freddie Ellis is the Ecuadorian Minister of Buen Vivo, as uh, we rightly pointed out at the beginning. That translates as good living and we'll explore um, where Ecuador is and where it's going. And Her Excellency Alenka Smirkol is Slovenian Minister without portfolio, uh, responsible for development strategic uh, projects and cohesion in a country with a vision for a happier society in 2050. To all of you on the panel, uh, welcome, happy? <coughs> Good. <laughs> uh, before we consider what practical steps then um, your countries are taking in the pursuit of a happier society, I just want to start uh, with a very simple question. Um, and let's really crack on through this, but I think it's important that the entire room here's what you three believe we mean by a happy society and why governments should care about a happy society. Minister, if you'd like to start. Yes. <laughs> so, um, thank you Vicky for the question. I would like to start by saying that we understand in the UAE that happiness is a personal choice. And happiness cannot be mandated or forced on people. People have the choice to choose to be happy. So the role of the government is to create the enabling environment, the right conditions to give the people the opportunity to choose to be happy. What do we mean by that? So if your kids are well educated, if you have good hospitals to go to if you feel sick, if you have a job to go every morning, and if you go about your day feeling safe and secure, and if you can get government services with dignity, with respect, then you feel you have hope and feel positive about the future. And this is the exact role of the government, to create the evening environment in the right conditions. And if we ask ourselves as governments, what is the ultimate goal behind everything we do? Why are we building hospitals? Why are we operating schools? Why are we enacting laws? The ultimate answer would be for people to lead a happy life. So, in a nutshell, the main purpose of the government anywhere in the world is to create happiness. Enabling an environment to do so. 
say. Freddie, just very briefly. I will ask, I will ask all to do what we're doing in schools. And it's silence. If we can have one minute of silence, so we can connect with our hearts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that the big revolution of the world is science. We talk too much. <laughs> we'll have millions of words in these days and always, and very few moments of silence. Especially in the media, in the internet, there's noise day and night, day and night, and we have been disconnected from our heart. So we believe that the first thing is to be connected with inside of us. That's where happiness lives. But we are searching happiness outside, measuring outside. And uh, we can talk about that later. I think that's the basic thing. Is the happiness that we have inside all of us, but we are not taking it. Thank you. And we'll come with some practical steps that uh, Ecuador has, uh, has carried out in order to uh, achieve a, a happier society. What about in Slovenia? What's your perception? What makes a happy society? It's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> it's true because uh, if you look at Slovenia, uh, Slovenia in many objectively measured rankings. We rank extremely high. We have really, everything is really almost at the top. But despite that, we have a problem that the life satisfaction subjective index is pretty low. Uh, and that was also one of the reasons why as a government we have decided to embark on a long process and a long journey and in a nutshell, try to find out what would make Slovenians happy. Um, and we really went for a visioning exercise. Uh, we started that journey a year and a half ago, and with the vision, concluded it uh, this Thursday, when we publicly presented the vision. And we did engage this, this is not a vision that came from um, government or official stakeholders who went all around the country and included hundreds and hundreds of people um, and checked with them. So we now believe we have a common point for our future, a picture of how as a society we want to live. Uh, we have 2050 as uh, a, 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 a target. target, and we will now, based on that, um, make moves, uh, do the long-term strategy, and all will somehow um, convert or converge it. A happy place. place. A happy place. All right. Well, let's talk about some of the practical steps. We, you, you, Excellency from Bhutan, you made it almost sound easy, and I know it isn't uh, to try and generate, you know, a much happier society. Um, Your Excellency, um, you've now been in the job for what nearly a year, I think. Um, this um, happiness program that you've instituted and the initiatives therein are very much part of the strategic vision for. Uh, this country 2021 and beyond. Can you just explain to us then 
some of the practicalities of that program and some of the challenges that you have uh, hit and how you feel some of the challenges might be overcome, because this isn't easy, is it? Thank you, Vicky. Uh, happiness is a complex concept, and it touches upon many sectors. And happiness means different things to different mm -hmm. people, and that's the challenging thing about happiness. In the UAE, we have the National Program for Happiness and Positivity. So we're working on happiness, but also we're working on values such as tolerance and positivity. These are important values that we would like to cultivate and nurture in our society. Our program has three pillars. First, we would like to promote happiness and positivity in everything we do. Second is measuring happiness. Mm -hmm. And the third one is how to make happiness and positivity a lifestyle. If we go to the first pillar, which is promoting happiness and positivity in everything we do, we would like to institutionalize happiness. We happiness systematically in everything that the government does, whether internally for the employees, mm -hmm. externally for the customers, and for the society at large. So we have appointed chief happiness and positivity officers. We have 60 of them. They just graduated last week. They are trained by UC Berkeley, What Works Center, and Oxford Mindfulness Center. And their job is to be the happiness champions with their entities, creating happy and positive environment, and working on customer happiness. So we don't have any service centers anymore in the UAE. We call them happiness centers. Because ha services is the daily interaction between people and the government. And we would like to make people's lives easy by making it easy, fast, and efficient. The second pillar is measuring happiness. Because if you don't measure happiness, then you cannot control it, you cannot improve on it. So we're measuring also happiness on three levels. Employee levels, which is within the entities. And by the way, for, I forgot to mention, Vicky, that we have a similar program to private sector to encourage the companies to adopt it also in their processes and services. And this will help us also in our competitiveness and our national economy. And we measure also the happiness of our customers. So if you go to uh, service and uh, happiness centers or you do online services, and Dr. Aish Ben Bashar, Director General of Smart Dubai, will talk about it, then you'll be asked to rate your experience in terms of happiness. And we conducted the National Survey for Happiness and Positivity, and thank you for Bhutan for inspiring us for doing so, which measures the enabling environment, the subjective well-being indicators and the objective indicators, whether health, education, living standards, economic growth, government services. The third pillar is about promoting happiness and positivity as a lifestyle. We would like to empower people to choose to be happy. Everyone is in pursuit of happiness, but some people, they don't know how. So we'd like to empower them by tools, by knowledge, through community initiatives or media initiatives. So people have a better understanding of happiness, what does it mean to them, what's their role. So they take, they, they be in charge, and they take responsibility and work on their personal happiness. Because personal happiness is our responsibility, it's not the government uh, responsibility. I would like to share, you, share with you one uh, initiative that we work with Dubai School, it's called the 100 Days of Positivity. The aim of this objective is to encourage students to practice and adopt the positive behavior because they are more naturally wired to be positive. Mm -hmm. So hopefully this will be a life skill for them because schools are not there just to educate the mind but also educate the heart. And this is part of community initiatives to promote happiness and positivity as a lifestyle. What did you learn from that initiative? Because it's one of the first, and it's a good one. So, so what did you learn, and, and, and where are the challenges, do you believe? We covered 66 schools, mm -hmm. 116 students, 116,000 students in Dubai. And I think it was very easy, because Vicky, they're naturally wired to be happy mm. and positive. But I think the influence of the student is not just within the schools, they will influence the parents, the families, and we went for 100 days because it takes 21 days to change a, a behavior and to happen. So we'd like them to have this as a life skill. Mm -hmm. And then they, because we have more than 200 nationalities in the UAE, they will be global ambassadors for happiness and positivity. Fascinating. Uh, Freddie, um, talk to us about the sort of work that's been done in Ecuador, the sort of performance indicators that you look to use and how you really measure success? 
whether you've had an awful lot of success. One of the happiest days in my life is when I met in Quito the Minister of Happiness. <laughs> because I was a Minister of Happiness and I thought I was alone in the world. <laughs> In 2008, Ecuador made a new constitution. The first constitution that has the rights of nature. Because we've been just working with human rights. What about the river? What about the trees? So the Ecuadorian constitution has the, the, the rights of uh, nature. That's the first part. Of it. Mm -hmm. And the second one is that four years later, we were developing very much in education, in health, in many different things. But we said we have much better roads, the best roads in Latin America now, in Ecuador. Before, they were the worst. Mm. But we don't have better drivers. <laughs> there are very good hospitals. But as in the rest of the world, there's more sick people. But we're just interested in doctors and in hospitals. But not in what is happening inside the people. So that's when the President of Ecuador created uh, the initiative for the construction of the Society of Buen Vivir. Buen Vivir is happiness. Buen Vivir is plentiful living. It's integral living. It's um, uh, peace inside of us. So we are working with all the ministers, very similar to what's happening here in the United Emirates. And, uh, uh, for example, to give you just uh, some, uh, this is a very important thing we made. It's called the book of all the children. It's the book of values and virtues. We believe that's a problem in the world. So there are beautiful, beautiful stories from all over the world uh, for the little children so the parents can read to the children before they um, go to sleep. And also they work every day in the class. Each children of eight, nine years has received this book. And we have found out that in some cases the children are teaching to their parents the values and virtues. Because the innocence has all the values and virtues. And they're teaching the teachers about the values and virtues. So it's a very, very interesting finding that we have. Things like that have not been done in other countries. It was very difficult. Now the Coca-Cola has big sim signals in Ecuador that we call the traffic light to announce red if there's too much sugar. <laughs> Yellow is middle and green, okay. All the products in Ecuador are with, with this sign. The um, World Health Organization has uh, uh, recognized this and uh, proposed to all the world to do this in relation to, um, to health, for example. And um, um, I said that something very important, uh, we will try to give you during the day a short uh, information about Ecuador for the, the age of time, because I say that this meeting, the first uh, uh, world dialogue on happiness, started 2,300 years ago. Because Aristotle's and Epicurus were talking about this every day. And then many people during history. We learned uh, something very important that uh, uh, it's here. In the um, 16th century, in the 14th century, and I'll read a little bit here because it's very important. His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid al Maktoum remembered that in the 14th century, one of the most important thinkers of its time, Ibn Khaldun, coincided with the essence of Aristotle's proposal. This scholar argued that a fundamental mission of the state is to guarantee life through justice, equality, and happiness. The problem is this, isn't it? That you will 
as ministers involved in the pursuit of happiness. And I know that you have referred to this excellency uh, from Bhutan in the past. It, you take something like gross national happiness as, 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 a, as a pursuit, as it were. And I know in the past you have even taught yourself, I believe, about the concept, can it be overused and will it mask problems? that exists? Will it mask problems of inequality, of competitiveness? So I'm looking and thinking about where each of your countries stand on the UN Happiness Survey of 2016, I think was the last one, am I correct in saying? Uh, they're done every 18 months. You're in a better position, for example, in Ecuador on a survey like that than you are on every other level when it comes to, for example, global competitiveness. So I guess my question is this. When we live in a world of, it seems, increasing inequality, um, and we are looking to a world that may, may or may not be shaped by globalization going forward, depending on uh, where uh, the US esteem leader goes next with, with his narrative, perhaps, how do you, ensure, do you use something like the gross happiness index, as it were, as opposed to GDP? How does happiness really slot in and I, talk, I know that we've talked about some of the practical steps that countries are taking, but how does it not become redundant should you look to the other indices which show a lag? We have to be very careful with the United Nations. Oh, has Helen gone? Yes. <laughs> I was going to stand for Helen, but she left. Because the three words, progress, development, and well-being mm. were created by the United Nations after the Second World War, and it meant more and more and more and more and more. Mm. And that's a problem of the world. Mm. So now the UNDP says we have to redefine, and Ecuador proposes that to the international community, mm. what progress should really mean, what development should really mean. Maybe 60 years ago, the most developed human being mm. was Mahatma Gandhi. Mm. And he had nothing. He had nothing. No wealth at all. The aboriginals of Ecuador, the natives of Ecuador, 500 years ago, did not have money. They didn't know what money was for 10,000 years until the Europeans arrived in Latin America. So the first part is very dangerous what we measure because the measurement of the United Nations, it depends what you ask. There are many, many rankings. We were surprised that in the Happy Planet ranking that was released uh, in, the, in the, that was the World Economic Forum, Ecuador in these 10 years went from place number 58 to top 10. Now we're, according to that, uh, index in top 10. Sure. Why? Because now they measure, and the United States does not measure, the ecological footprint. Mm. If so you don't measure what is the harm you, you are doing to the planet, then the ones that are in front go to the back. And you the make a very good the point. The come to the front. So it's very, very, very special the way, and just another example, we were surprised the University of Michigan, Chicago, and Illinois made a world survey about empathy. And suddenly we read in the newspaper last uh, year, number one in the world, Ecuador. <laughs> we were the first surprise, <laughs> why? <laughs> and finally, <laughs> we are not measuring that big thing. And finally, Gallup makes every year a measurement about happiness, coinciding with the, with the day of the United Nations. In for the last two years, Ecuador is in the second place in the world. Almost like winning the uh, football world. <laughs> <laughs> but why, what do they measure? Mm. It's a very short thing. They did it in 133 countries. They measure five things. Number one, what, how did you sleep yesterday? Mm. Without pills. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, did you learn something yesterday? Number three, did they, did they treat you well in your community? And number four, um, <laughs> <laughs> this is good 
journalist, I should know this, but I don't. ¿Cuál es el cuarzo? ¿El cuarzo cuál es? Dime, dime, dime. Learn no, something. No. Did you learn something? Oh, that one. Did you laugh a lot? <laughs> <laughs> That's number four. Good for you. No? And, uh, and it's very interesting. Yeah. Eight of the ten top are from Latin America. Yeah, no, fascinating. I think Costa so, Rica, so, top of the Happy so, Planet yeah. Index, right? Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> It's, a, it's a something new, but I really think that what's happening here is fantastic. I think this can be the most important meeting yeah. in the world, yeah. in the world this moment. Yeah, you're, you're because absolutely. the future is being shaped precisely when we start to think about the deep meaning of our life and not of how much do we have. So let me just ask. I'll ask you, um, in, in compiling the list of world rankings, I know that the UN survey, which uh, Freddie, Freddie doesn't uh, uh, put much stock in, but it takes into account a variety of factors. I'm thinking GDP, life ex expectancy, uh, perceptions of corruption, personal freedoms, charity, and the generosity of, of, of people in each country. And I think you've alluded to a number of those as being included in the way uh, that you will define or are defining happiness here and, and measuring it and, 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 and shaping the sort of overall impact on, on people's lives. What about in Slovenia? We didn't give you much of a chance to talk about the 2050 vision. I know that you include, uh, for example, the environmental factors and the footprint for Slovenia incredibly important again, correct? Yeah, it's true. Um, but I think that's, yeah, if, if I just spend a few words on what the vision of Slovenia in 2050 is, uh, and if you then compare it to other countries, uh, environment is important, but it's somehow included in the quality of life, not well-being, but more perhaps well-living. Mm -hmm. This is really the concept, and in this concept, uh, everything comes in. It's uh, a new way of a lifestyle, um, the change to the circular economy, if you want to be, if you want to see, if you want to make it happen. Uh, and protecting the environment we have. What, are you, what, what practical steps are you taking to ensure that this vision isn't just a vision? <laughs> we are. This is now uh, the, the second step. Mm. Uh, as I said, we released the vision last Thursday, but we are very much involved already in a long-term strategy, which is not 2050, but 2030, mm -hmm. and which uh, will define strategic priorities uh, and of course then goals with very specific measurements mm -hmm. so everything has to be measured I, I fully agree uh, and we are now um, designing the policies to come slowly pers to pursue the 2050 visions that's what we just, just go include uh, what we also do is uh, we merged the two processes uh, with this uh, long-term strategy. Uh, somehow we were very, very lucky to also, uh, th that it came at the time when the UN uh, 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda uh, mm. was uh, uh, enforced. So we merged the two processes, so all our uh, strategic priorities and goals will also reflect the 2030 agenda. So, and we are a sort of a pioneering country in this respect, with a little bit of luck, I have to say. And perhaps you have as many questions as you have answers for many of the experts in this audience, which is, I assume, one of the reasons that, that, you, that you were eager to be here today. Because as, uh, as uh, Freddie was pointing out, I mean, th th this is the most extraordinary gathering of experts, global experts, on, on how to actually effect this. Because I think, Minister, again, you'll say that none of this is easy, correct? I mean, and, and perhaps to all of you, it's the, it's the being held to account and how you affect sort of, you know, the stats on this, which is going to be a difficult long-term strategy, correct? I have to say that already the first three speeches, you know, <laughs> um, was already enough of inspiration. Good. And the big reason of my coming here has been completed already because I made, uh, I don't make notes a lot. 
that during all the speeches I made my personal notes and I really thank already. Excellent. All of, it's, it's, it's That's even before that we've had coffee this morning. <laughs> 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 my, my head goes like, you know, it's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, and yes, uh, you are right, I have much more questions than answers. But what I think is important is that the, the way and we now have a clear pathway so now we, the government, are responsible to follow it and really try to come there. And I will try and do my best to be there and um, to, push, to push forward, but it's not easy. No. <laughs> what keeps you awake at night, Minister, at the moment? I sleep well. It's very important to unhappiness and we're responsible for our personal happiness. So I take good care of myself, right. detox, I sleep uh, well. Yeah. Uh, if you allow me, uh, Vicky, just yes. I have a couple of uh, comments. So you mentioned that happiness may mask some issues. Mm. I think the main thing that we need to acknowledge that the main purpose of the development is to create well-being and happiness for people. And by acknowledging that the purpose of development is happiness, we can work on the challenges that face governments around the world. And it's very important that we focus on happiness. Right now, right now around the world, there are 350 million people illiterate. Number of jobless people by 2017 is expected to be around 200 million people. 1.3 billion uh, uh, people live under extreme poverty. Around three, more than 380 million people, they don't have access to clean water. Around, I think, uh, 65 million people are displaced because of conflicts. Because of all these reasons, it's very important that we focus on happiness. Because focusing on happiness and doing the right thing for our people, we together can change these statistics. And it's not the choosing between the economic growth and the well-being. They should go hand in hand. And we believe that the future will be for the countries who will transform the economic growth into well-being for their people. Because there's no use of achieving economic growth while people are miserable or they, there is no well-being for the society. And I think uh, Mrs. Helen Clark talked about this. It's not just the amount of growth, but also the quality and type of growth. Freddie, we're running out of time. Last word, if you will. <laughs> Vicky, we're living in a schizophrenic world, especially the media. Yes. <laughs> I come from the media. I'm a I thought I was going to get away with uh, not getting any negative comments. I thought if I offer the negative comments today, I, nobody else. I come from the media. I've done that all my life. But in the morning, in the news, they say there are terrible news. The science say the hottest uh, 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 year in the history all these ecological problems, all these uh, terrible things. That same man, in the same station, in the night, they say, good news, this country will grow three points more. <laughs> they will sell millions of cars more. So we, inside of us, it's a problem of greed and love. I think at the end is that. We have to choose, or greed or love. They, they cannot be together. It's like the night and the day. And that is, uh, that is the, the most important part of it. I, I need that I have to acknowledge uh, the kingdom of Bhutan. We respect that very much. Because after Thomas Jefferson said the pursuit of happiness, after Simon Bolivar said that happiness was the most important uh, responsibility of a government, we forgot that word until the king of Bhutan rang the bell. <coughs> Nobody cared too much at the beginning. Now all the world is talking about that. So that is very, very, very important for us. Buen vivir means just three things. One, harmony with nature. Number two, harmony with other human beings. And three, living in community. And three, the most important, harmony inside of us. Because we can never be always happy, but we can always be in peace inside.
for me yes. to finish to finish with this because because it's um, uh, just 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 two things is um, one maybe we can talk afterwards this is the great problem of the world and I'm I'm so glad that Elon Musk is here I have a chapter here that says can robots pursue happiness. Can we discuss? No, we really, discussed? that's the big problem of the world, that <laughs> artificial point. intelligence. Yes. And, and just to finish, yes. I, I have to recognize this. I say, the, I, I was very much surprised for this, because I read a book that the minister uh, gave me in Quito, and I, and I read this. The real answer to this noble endeavor of happiness, of humanity, has been clearly stated by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, when he stated that his advice to all is to lead a simple life. Simplicity starts in the heart, he said, away from negativity and pessimism. In his revealing book, Flashes of Thought, he said, our founding father, Sheikh Sayed, may God bless his soul, was the most realistic of all world leaders that I had the opportunity of knowing. He was also the happiest and the one that smiled the most. He loved the beauty of life. Despite his hectic schedule and the burden of his responsibilities, he searched it in poetry and in prose, in the land and in the sea. This is a magnificent definition of what Buen Vivir is.